Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ramona Kraper, and I'm part of the ZFA team. And I also run an Israel advocacy account called Did You Know? Before I start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. The Zionist Federation of Australia is the federal roof body of all Zionist organisations and activities in Australia. It aims to create a thriving and strong Australian Jewish community with an unshakable bond to Israel. The ZFA has an emphasis on connection, advocacy and leadership. And the ZFA conversations are a part of our way to connect global experts on a range of topics, all relevant to Israel and the Jewish world. Today's conversation is moderated by Dr. Rachel Kahn, AO, who is well known to many of us in the community. Dr. Kahn is an award-winning producer and broadcaster. Born in Canada, she earned an honors bachelor, master's and PhD in religious studies. Dr. Khan was the longtime host and pro executive producer of The Spirit of Things and The Ark on ABC Radio National, and she has won many awards for her documentaries. In 2013, she co-founded the International Association of Religion Journalists, for which she served as vice president. Dr. Khan is also the author of multiple books. Tonight, she will be in conversation with two insightful and wise panelists, Alon. Alonis Sun is the International Relations Coordinator at the Department for Pioneering Youth and Future Generations in the World Zionist Organization. Alon holds a Bachelor in Social Work and a Master's from the Mandel Institute for Social Leadership. After finishing his army service as an artillery commander, Alon spent most of his professional life focusing on Zionism and leadership through informal education across the world. Alon was here in Melbourne two years ago for the Educators Conference, and I had the privilege of meeting him, and I know he'll be great tonight. Since October 7th, Alon was drafted for reserve duty in the IDF Paratroopers Brigade as a mental health officer, known in Hebrew as Kaban. Alon has been treating soldiers and commanders before and after combat, dealing with trauma and building mental strength. We look forward to hearing about your experiences. And Dr. Moshe Falchi, who is the founder and the head of the Stress, Trauma and Resilience Studies in the Department of Social Work at Tel Chai University. Dr. Falchi is a world leader in the frontline mental health and is an expert in emergency mental health interventions, including psychological first aid. Dr. Falchi has been to more than 30 conferences and has published several innovative articles and books. A few weeks ago, Dr. Falchi was disinvited from a mental health conference in the Gold Coast. The conference was hosted by the Australia and New Zealand Mental Health Association. And tonight, the president of the Australia and New Zealand Mental Health Association, Dr. Philip Morris, has joined us and would like to say a few remarks. Dr. Morris, thank, we thank you for your willingness to address us tonight. Well, Ramona, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, Yes, and thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak to um, your group uh, and being able to say something that I have wanted to say for quite a while. Um, you've mentioned that uh, our colleague here, uh, and I welcome both our colleagues, uh, uh, Alan and also uh, Moshe, to Australia in a sense by um, through through the, the, the streaming of the video, um, and it's great to have you here. Um, I wanted to say to Dr. Moshe that our organization, which was, I think, one of the sponsors of the meeting that he was asked to attend, which was, I think, called the Frontline Mental Health Conference in the Gold Coast, which is close to where I live. Um, what happened was that uh, he was asked not to participate or not to give his paper. Now, this was wrong. We made a big mistake and uh, it was not done for any malice. It was not done to disrespect him or the Jewish community in Australia or overseas. It was a, um, a decision made um, by people who felt that this was the right thing to do when they'd been basically given a whole lot of attacking material from people who were very pro the Palestine cause and were trying to, in a sense, uh, make the conference a very difficult place for anybody to come to 
unless Dr. Moshe had not been invited. Now, a mistake was made. Um, we apologise for that. And I personally apologise to Dr. Moshe for what happened. And I apologise to the Jewish community in Australia and overseas because it's caused great hurt. And uh, the reality is that we should not be taking people away from conferences in, for any reason when others try to uh, sort of force their opinions on us and force the conferences to do things that they shouldn't be doing. So we certainly apologise for that. I apologise for that. We're trying to make good on this. We're uh, giving, of course, Dr. Moshi all uh, his expenses in terms of airfares and accommodation back so he's not out of pocket. And we're trying now to see whether he can give us the talk that everybody was coming along to listen to, which is, of course, the talk that I think he's probably going to give a bit tonight uh, on what he's doing and, and the, the wonderful things that he's doing to help people in frontline mental health situations, both in terms of police, ambulance, firefighters and in the military. And so uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get him to speak probably um, by video to the people that would have otherwise heard him had he not been asked to not to participate in the conference. So I thought I would like to say this so that everybody's very clear about the fact that we very much um, regret uh, what happened and we regret what happened in the sense as a consequence to the Jewish community in Australia and overseas. That's, that's what I wanted to say and it was said with great humility and also um, very genuinely. So thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. Okay. Okay, well, now I go over to Rachel, I think. Yes, Dr. Morris, thank you very much for participating this evening. And I am sure um, that um, Dr. Farhi um, would have some, some interesting comments to say in response to your, uh, to your apology and your sincere uh, statement that a mistake was made. I, I'd like to um, ask you, Dr. Farhi, how you, how you take this um, particular uh, response from Dr. Morris. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morris. I really, really appreciate. I really appreciate <laughs> I, you, your honest and sincere, sincere and apologize. And I think, well, actually, I'm sure that it, this decision was not like uh, uh, um, pretending to me that the vote of the Australian people or the organization, it was because of this huge amount of threat that were accepted or transmitted by those organizations and well that, that I think that the um in my behalf really I would like just to put this aside and to move forward and I look forward for more and more collaboration because I think that we have so many things important things to do in the future and we cannot allow this you know group of people to disturb us. So I agree. I, I, I think, think this apology is so important and I really, really appreciate it. And, and let's just keep on moving forward. Well, the question certainly lingers in all our minds um, as we witness the doxing of Jews who support Israel, the exclusion of Israelis like Moshe Farki from conferences. The question remains, what will it take to put a stop to this kind of intimidation? because giving into it emboldens the anti-Semites and gives support to the view that Israel does not have a right to exist. The Jewish response very often is not to cause trouble, you know, not to rock the boat that is gently sailing along. And yet history has shown us that anti-Semitism is a light sleeper, as it's called, uh, and um, it doesn't work. So um, perhaps Alon, can you, uh, comment on how you think we can um, stand up to this kind of intimidation? Well, if I knew the answer would be somewhere else today, it's, uh, it's really just sad hearing uh, everything you said and just seeing what's going on. I must say that my head was stuck in the Israeli mud in the war with everything that's going on. And uh, really, uh, we just didn't have time to, you know, open the phone to go on the internet or Facebook and see what's going on around the world. But uh, I came home about a month ago and I've witnessed, uh, you know, through my job and through social media, uh, everything that you all are saying, and it's just, it's terrifying and it's awful. 
And uh, we, you know, in my position in the uh, department in the WZO, we're trying to focus on the youth. Yes. And, you know, on the younger ages and trying to build an understanding of uh, what's going on. And sometimes it could be hard and sometimes it could be complex. And sometimes it's not, uh, you know, uh, a right or wrong answers or black or white answers. Um, and it takes time to understand that. Um, mm. But I think that showing uh, what's going on, showing the real stories, true stories of true people, and what are they going, or what are they going through, and trying to give the tools and the resources, uh, if it's through uh, social media or, or lectures or zooms or 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 everyone can find their own uh, tools to actually promote their opinions. But I I think that just trying to be real and sincere having real conversations just like the ones we're having tonight are key to, uh, to improve those kind of things and trying to impact the youth because uh, uh, they're the future leaders. Some of them are all already the, the present leaders in their youth movements, in their communities, and they go into their campuses and they're facing so many difficult situations. And uh, I think uh, our job is to try and help them as much as we can and showing them the truth and the resources to improve. Well, Moshe Farki, you have been involved in trying to help people in trauma for a very long time and in very different situations. And right now you have your hands full. There are the actual survivors of October 7th, and there are the families of soldiers who have been lost defending Israel. And then there's the larger Israeli population who face the prospect of an ongoing war. Perhaps you can speak to each of these, but it, can I ask you one general question? And that is if trauma is in fact generalizable and does the treatment come down to some basic principles that apply to all or is each and every situation, those that I've named, uh, very, uh, very specific and requiring a very, very specific kind of approach? Well, thank you so much uh, for this question. So actually, it depends about how do we define trauma, and then the answer will be more uh, uh, simple. So actually, until like 2013, we defined a trauma by three main objectives, which are like huge amount of fear, huge amount of threat, and huge amount of helplessness. And But after 2013, there was another debate, and there was a new definition of trauma, which was focusing not about the subjective parts like threat, fear, and helplessness, but about the certain events like sudden deaths, uh, 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 sexual assault. So uh, the board of the DSM, this book, who is actually uh, uh, recognizing the events as trauma decided that there are certain events which are traumatic. In my behalf, um, I think the trauma is subjective, meaning that we have to differentiate between events which are extremely terrible, extremely, you know, with lots of harm, extremely sad, and so on, and events that are perceived as trauma. And these are huge differences because we could see also through the 7th of October event, that so many people who experienced those terrible events did not react in acute stress reaction symptoms and they did not develop further on PTSD symptoms. So from my behalf, I think, the term of like, uh, or the, the try to make trauma like a general event is not so correct. And sometimes it will might also be wrong to generalize that because if I'll provide immediate inform interventions for those who do not need that, I might make things more, you know, harm than good. So speaking of the Israeli population as a whole, without going to, to certain, you know, uh, population, what we understood is that, well, we cannot, in general, take like couples of millions, millions of people and start 
bringing them to the clinics. It's also impossible. So the main idea, also for the soldiers and for the civilians, is let's provide everybody with basic and simple tools, first of all, that they can handle themselves. Uh, and these simple tools that I'm sure that Alon knows quite a lot as a mental health officer, uh, provide the ability for each person to provide immediate aid for his friend or colleague. And that reduces quite a lot the percentages of the people who need more treatments and more interventions. And that's how more or less that we can maintain in one hand our ability to function through all this terrible event and provide the, the right and, and correct intervention for those who, are, who need these interventions. Well, Alon, you have described yourself as a people person and an optimist, and uh, no doubt this helps you working with soldiers, especially those who are about to go into the fray, and uh, and also uh, speaking with those or treating those who have come out. Now, I know there must be much more than sort of gung ho. Uh, you know, go in there. How, in fact, do you prepare young and perhaps older uh, men uh, and women who have may never see their families again? I mean, this must be front of mind for many of them. Yeah, um, it wasn't easy. It's, uh, it's a challenging task. Um, I must say that um, soldiers today I feel are a bit different than the soldiers at my time, 10 years ago. A lot of them say that they're more afraid of post-traumatic stress disorder than they're afraid of a bullet or being killed or injured. They're terrified at being post-traumatic, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Oh. And what we're trying to do is telling them and showing them that not just as Dr. Faki said, not everyone was going through some sort of trauma would face post-traumatic stress disorder. And sometimes you can even grow from a trauma and be stronger from a trauma and discover things about yourself that you didn't even know about your strength, about your resources, about how you can capable, you can work during uh, really stressful uh, situations. So we're, we're trying to show um, also the, the, the good things, if you can say, that could come out of trauma. Um, and trying to really normalize, normalize their thoughts and their feelings, saying that it's okay if you're not sleeping this, this that well after an occasion. It's okay if you're not as hungry as you used to and you have some sort of uh, flashbacks or things that really, really scare the soldiers. And we're really trying to normalize their feelings and say that, you know, uh, uh, you're going through a war things that are so, so difficult. So, you know, they're, they're just, it's unbelievable just to try and understand what they went through on October 7th. And every feeling that they feel, every situation that they're in, it's fine. It's fine what they're feeling. We're there to help them and escort them along the way, but really, really normalize their thoughts and their feelings is, is, is key to what we're trying to do. I heard a survivor of the kidnapping uh, this morning, Moran Stella Yanai. Uh, she spoke to the UIA Women's Division this morning, and she spoke about having mental fortitude, being assured of uh, her power, her inner power. She also spoke about prayer and how important prayer was for her. And, and how much it helped her. Is there, is there something to that? Um, we've, we've certainly sometimes heard from our parents, Holocaust survivors or grandparents, about what it was that um, allowed them to survive traumatic situations. Um, but I, I wonder how easy it is to talk about power when you're in such a powerless situation. I, I think that what we try to do as mental health officers is first before 
the war before uh, the actual combat, preparing the commanders, preparing the soldiers, trying to prepare them for what they're going to witness, whether they're going to smell, whether they're going to see, trying to give them actual tools before what's going on. And later being there during combat, you know, they're not fighting three weeks in a row. Sometimes some soldiers go out of uh, of uh, the war zone and get some sort of, uh, you know, uh, first aid, mental first aid. Um, and then after uh, combat, giving them again some sort of closure, some sort of treatment. So we're trying to be there along the way, across the way, and, and giving them that support. I want to say another thing. One of our focuses are is about talking about their why. Why are they here? What is the source, their motivation on what they're doing? Some could be religious. Some could be Zionism. Some could be their families. Some could be their, you know, the, the brothers in arms and the people that they're fighting with. Everyone has their own motivation. It could be releasing the kidnapped. It could be, you know, you, anyone has a different uh, approach to it. And we're trying to tell them, think of why are you here? What is your motivation? Uh, and I think that's a very, very strong uh, sense of uh, uh, strength, mental strength once you're in, in combat or in a, in a situation that your life is at risk. Dr. Farki, you have uh, also been um, writing about the importance of compassion uh, and action. And these are two possible kinds of responses to trauma. Um, it's very difficult for people here in Australia. We, we feel immensely, immensely sad and immensely sorry. But um, really, um, the, 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 it seems to me the best way we can possibly assist and, and keep our spirits up and keep the spirits up of Israelis is, is to do as much as we can. It's kind of the, the act, the action side. Um, what have you found in terms of the effectiveness of the sort of passive compassionate response versus the active, um, the active response? So, um, well, I believe that one of the most important thing is timing, what to do when. And through the immediate crisis or through the immediate threat, the main idea is to be active and effective. And uh, it's not only like a belief, it's because of our, our neurological aspects. The more we are active, the more we are cognitive, the less we are emotional. So the most we can function well. So during the, the immediate phase, we are less compassion and more proactive. And this is in order to enable us to be able to move forward and to handle the situation as best as we can. Moreover, if we shall be, if we shall be more compassion to a person, soldier, civilian, who is right now under threat and needs to function, we should actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, reduce the person's ability to cope with the situation. So in terms of timeline, on the, the first, you know, the first timeline of the situation, let's be more cognitive, less compassion. Going forward, we need to, to keep in our mind two things. One is, what is the, the main goal of our intervention? And, you know, the main goal of each and every intervention, usually, is to enable the person to regain his abilities to cope independently with the situation. So we try to decrease the dependency of the people in the professionals. We try only to provide them with abilities to handle themselves with the situation. Um, having that in mind, we should provide, of course, the compassion. Yes. But it, it will be 
it will be as needed, no more. Uh, I want the person, I want a community. I want, the, for example, not only the, the community of, of the, the soldiers, I want the whole Israeli community as a, as a nation to be able to, to handle the current situation, to be able to receive compassion, and to be able to move forward. We cannot let ourselves like dive into the situation. We need all the time to be able, you know, to, to go through this timeline. So this is very delicate balance between compassion and activation. So in the first stages, we shall be more and more and more proactive. Then of course we can provide the compassion. By the way, in, in terms of compassion, in the beginning of the war, the whole Israeli media was just providing this on and on messages, we hug you people, and I was desperately trying to ask the media, stop hugging the population. The population right now needs more tasks, more things to do, less hugging at that stage. Right. Alon, I wonder, um, in your experience of talking to soldiers who have come back from Gaza, can you give us an example or a couple of examples of, of, of really challenging situations? Um, do, do the soldiers come back um, really intending to, you know, go back into the fray? Are they, are they uh, um, still pretty strong or do you have to do a lot of work with them? I think that most of them feel like going back home is the challenging task. Being inside of Gaza, as weird as it sounds, you feel so meaningful. You're with uh, people that you trust and you trust them with your life. You feel every day that you're doing something that is really, could save lives. And then you come back to Israel, you come back to your routine job, you come back to your life, and there's a, sometimes a crack over there. You're, you're not sure what are you going to do now? Uh, you're going to drink your coffee in your kitchen just like any other day. Uh, some tell me, you know, in Gaza, they don't, uh, you know, open the fridge because the, the food is, is there for weeks or they don't turn on the light in the, in, in the room at night and they go back home. To Israel and they're amazed that they're, they're not able to mentally open the fridge because they're not used to doing that. They're not ready to take a shower in the hot water because they haven't done that in weeks. So going back home, going back to studying or your family or your kids, uh, it's a challenging task and I can say it about myself. I wasn't uh, personally in Gaza but uh, I was in uh, reserve duty and just coming back home to my uh, 10 month a years old uh, a baby and, and my wife, it, it takes time to get back to, to life. Yes, and, it's, uh, it's an old yeah. story after all. Um, this is the typical situation of veterans who feel like they are still in another world. So is that decompression uh, period, very important. Is that something that you um, you manage to provide for soldiers? Yeah, we're, we're there to try and meet every soldier that comes out of Gaza, every, and I'm actually saying that individually, every person we're trying to get to him, have a short conversation or a long conversation, have a group, you know, every unit uh, has a, some sort of a process, mental processing sessions, talking about how are we getting back home? How are we getting back to school or our families or our work? We are there as mental health officers, really trying to be there. And as Dr. Fahi said, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the position of the commanders is, is also very important. It's not only us, the professionals. It's, we're not there the entire time because we don't want to uh, uh, have some sort of a mental collapse or someone really uh, seeing a kaban, a mental health officer can really uh, slow you down instead of actually doing something active, being in action. Uh, I, I would say one more thing, soldiers come back to the base and, and it's terrible saying that, but they, they wanna go back to their families for a weekend 
and take time, take it easy and have a good meal and have a hot shower. But sometimes that's not the right thing to do. They need to stay in the base with their friends, with their soldiers in an army uh, framework because that shift, that change in, in, in the balance of what you're doing could be really hazardous. So we're trying to sometimes try and being there also uh, in that period of time before going home or before finishing uh, some sort of a mission. Well, Israel is a country that has, I mean, it began in trauma and uh, it has had nine major wars and almost 10,000 soldiers and servicemen uh, and people were, were killed in terrorist attacks. So there is a, a kind of uh, history, a timeline, as it were, of trauma. And, and Moisha, I, I wonder, this, this obviously must take an enormous toll on the average Israeli. Um, and I wonder whether you have seen uh, that it has changed over time, the nature of that toll, how it is expressed. I think, Alon, you, you mentioned that uh, soldiers are uh, more fearful of PTSD, but um, there's, a, there, there's a whole country that is, in a sense, uh, plunged into trauma with, with, uh, from October 7th. Yes, in a sense, this is correct. Um, again, there is a but. First of all, along the way, and, and you have mentioned nine wars, yes, and we try to learn from our mistakes in terms of mental health. And then we try to, to learn from, unfortunately, so many mistakes done in the 73 war in Yom Kippur. Uh, and then moving on to the Lebanon war and to all the... the uh, you know, escalation in, in the northern part and southern part of Israel throughout these years. So it's not only learning from the mistakes about the, the army side, but it's also learning from mistakes about the whole population. And so we provide the ability in one hand to take treatments as needed, and again, as I said before, but we all the time encourage the population to be more and more active. I think that in terms of the country of Israel, we cannot have the luxury, sort of saying, to be those who are feeling too much miserable because we need, we have so many challenges ahead. So we have all the time we need to move and move and move. But Israel population, as I can see in trying to make a journal, kind of understands, kind of understands that so many things are out of our control, but our things, other things are very much within our control. Our ability to control our lives, the family, schools. So we try to look for things that we can control. Uh, one of the things, for example, that we've learned not from any war, or, uh, or, or any kind of escalation, but from the COVID-19 situation just two years ago, was that in any events of uncertainty, let's look for the things that can be certain. For example, if I cannot plan the next two weeks, I can plan the next two, three, four hours ahead. And we try to look for the things that we can control and sense of control increases also our self-efficacy, our ability to, to act, our self-confidence, and many, many other things. And this is also in terms of German population, for example, encourage those soldiers that Alon was talking about uh, to shift back into routine. So we understood that we've, for so long time, we've, uh, uh, trained our people to shift from, you know, routine into emergency. But we didn't give enough thought how to do the opposite, how to shift the people from emergency into routine. And this is totally different 
game. Totally different situation, mentally, physically, socially. So what Alonso was talking about is so correct. We need to do this shift in the process. From the emergency to routine should take or takes much longer than the immediate shift that takes seconds from like routine to emergency. This is totally different things. And we have understood this. I'm happy to say that. Uh, and that is why Alon was describing this process with the soldiers, but we are doing the same thing with the community. We prepare the community, you know, to shift back into their routine in the process. Well, Alon, you were uh, nodding your head. Did you want to add to that by any, in any way? Oh. For me, it's a good feeling because if uh, Dr. Farhi uh, says that we're doing something right, then I can sleep well at night. Uh, it's such a big honor. And, uh, and you know, I, I think even in the personal uh, aspect, it's just, it's really not easy. You know, October 7th, I was home with my family, with my little boy. I wasn't planning on going into the army for four months and having you know, I, I'm not even a social worker on my day-to-day -day life. I work at the WZO. So it's not even my primary profession. And and just like that, in a, in a push of a button, uh, you got to shift yourself mentally and say goodbye to your family and drive your car to the base, not knowing for how long, what are you going to do? And, and it's it's really even someone who really deals with mental strength. It's it's a challenge. I remember myself in the car saying, maybe I'll drive a bit slower. Maybe I'll just take a little bit more time because I don't want to get into the base because once I'm in the base, that's it. Um, so it's a big challenge. But once I went into the base and I started putting the mental health officer cap and I was active and I was doing things and I was there to help others, I felt so much better about myself and, and and it's just you can see it on every little thing that you do it, it really makes a huge difference just being active it could be sports it could be anything that you can do that feels like you're doing something and not just staring on your phone social media all the time uh, even the soldiers you know some of the soldiers are 18 19 they saw all the videos of what's going on in October 7th, and then they were called to duty. So it's it's such a terrifying task to do once you're 18, and that shift mentally is, is one of the, the hardest challenges, I think. Well, speaking of an abrupt shift, there was no greater shift than for those who were uh, living in the Kibbutzim close to the Gaza border who had developed relationships with the Gazans and were very optimistic about their future cooperation, etc. And clearly they were being infiltrated and, of course, diabolically betrayed. And my, my question is how, for one thing, how, how could there have been so much naivete uh, uh, around the relationship between Israelis and Gazans? I mean, that's a big question that I think many people have. How could they have been so naive? How could their ideals of, of peace, you know, the Shalom Achshav movement, which we all know about, how could it have so thoroughly shifted their sense of reality and therefore um, made them so extremely vulnerable? That is, that, that's perhaps an unkind question because you don't want to blame victims, but, but a question must be raised as to, you know, how could this have happened? Um, uh, putting aside, of course, uh, the next question, which is about um, the lack of um, I IDF presence, the, the lack of protection um, by, by, um, by the army right at the beginning, but there's that, there's a big question about the nature of the relationship, the breakdown, and how incredibly bereft uh, these survivors must be feeling. Not only have they lost uh, many of their own families and community members, but they've also, I think, 
must have some of their ideals shattered. So how does, how does one respond to that? That's a, a very tough question. Um, I think that maybe not everyone, in, my wife's sister is from Kfar Aza. She lives on that kibbutz, and at that day she was in 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 a shelter for thirty six hours, um, you know, fighting for her life. Um, and I'm not sure she's in Kfar Aza because of Zionism or because any other values. She's there because her boyfriend's family's from there, um, and I don't. I I feel like. You know, I was there two two weeks before October seventh. I was I was in Faraza. It's 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 a paradise. It's green. It's beautiful. There's a strong community. You ask yourself, wow, this is a, a, a remarkable place. This is really heaven on earth. And then two weeks later, it became hell. And I think that some people are there because of the actual Zionistic values or their political approach. And some are there because it's maybe better economically, because their family is there. And, uh, and, and I know from, you know, knowing uh, my wife's sister, she's feeling terrible that she survived and so many other people didn't. Uh, it's a terrible feeling knowing I survived, but, but why? Why was I there and not someone else? It's, there's so many thoughts going on to your head and it's not easy. Moshe, um, I don't know whether you want to respond to that, but I also have another kind of question for you, and that is the, that there is, of course, a strong political dimension to this tragedy, which will become perhaps more apparent as the inquiry into the handling of October 7th reveals its findings. Um, there must be a great deal of anger uh mostly at Hamas of course but and and the PA but but also at the government for somehow not protecting not preventing uh having the soldiers in the wrong place at the wrong time um anger is there so as as a social worker as someone who understands trauma that is not only the feeling of helplessness but also rage uh, at what has happened to you um can anger be you, you know positively channeled how can how can israel get get through this with your help well i'll get back just for one minute to the previous question that adon was responding um you, you use the word naive but i guess it's a mixture of being a bit naive there is faith there is hope, there is a belief that a person who is next to me, just over the fence, is a person also who wants to raise his children and to have his, his, his you know, uh, uh, family raised up in peace. And, and then came October 7th. And like, you know, it dropped a huge bomb, like 5,000 tons on our country and mainly on on those uh villages around the gaza and uh what we understood almost immediately is that again during the immediate stage we didn't have the time nor the ability to deal with this naive situation we had to cope with the situation and um, what was very interesting was that we understood that we, not only as a nation, but we as a people, has a huge amount of defense mechanisms that enabled us to cope with the situation. So part of the people succeeded just to, to go through. Others described the events more as technical events, less as experience. Others describe that they succeeded to freeze and that's how they succeeded to, to survive the situation. But we studied 
that, that we have to respect this defense mechanism, even though they last longer than it's needed. Meaning, if there are people right now, five months after, who still keep on being surrounded by their defense mechanism, let them be, as long as they function okay, as long as they do not so suffer from any kind of intrusive thoughts and so on, let them be. And maybe, going back, one of the defense mechanisms maybe wasn't so helpful, was, and maybe still is, to believe that the people on the other side of the fence are not Hamas. They are forced by internal forces um, to, to be cruel and, and so on. And I think those who want to go back to villages in, in next to the border is not only because of they will feel more secure because there will be more armed and so on and, and more security. It's also because they believe that this evil is not everywhere. And eventually, there are people on both sides that want to live. Um, in terms of... of uh, no, I, I'm not a political person and my, my political view is, is not part of it. But there's a huge sense that all the security uh, organizations, everyone, and of course the government failed to provide the basic security for the people. And there's all there's another sense, generally, there's another sense that these things needs to be taken care of. At, at the beginning of the stage, we just wanted to, you know, to fight back. Now there is a time to understand whatever happened before and to have our lessons learned. So it won't, you know. There's a question will not, here from will David. not happen again. Oh, yes. sorry. That it will not happen again. And and that that is why that is why there is an ongoing movement in Israel, ongoing on and on and on. First of all, towards the government, let's understand whatever happened politically, towards the whole security forces in Israel. Again, let's learn what happened, let's correct. And I think that these demands are quite right, regardless the our political view. There is a sort of elephant in the room, which uh, well, there are quite a few, but it, it's very a very crowded room. But <laughs> one of them is, of course, the enormous death toll that has resulted from the way a heavily populated Gaza was used as a launching pad uh, for war. And of course, it breaks all international conventions on war, and yet it has worked for the Gazans up until now. Now, they, now there is no hiding. Uh, they, are, they have died in their thousands. And my guess is that, my guess is that Israelis do not take this lightly. And Alon, I wondered how, how do the soldiers you have spoken to respond to this dilemma that they need to crush Hamas. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and, and, and yet there is this enormous death toll. Do, do, do they speak to you about it? Is it something that uh, comes up? Yeah, it definitely comes up. Um, yeah. Every discussion with a mental health officer, a Kaban is a confidential it's not something that we're allowed to pass forward to the commanders or their families so uh, a lot of a lot of issues raise up in those conversations some of them are you know fear of battle fear of fighting and what of, what would my brothers in arms say about me and some of them are is what we're doing the right thing is it uh, my value set 
Um, yes, some soldiers think that things should look differently, um, and some don't. Uh, they're 18. Some of them just, you know, they don't even think about it. They think about different things at all. Um, and uh, I think it's a very complex situation. And some soldiers that are, were inside saying, we made it, maybe needed to do something differently. Maybe we should have acted with more force. Maybe we should have acted with less force. But at the 90% of the time, they're focusing on really being safe and taking care of themselves and their friends and, their, and just staying alive. Um, and, and sometimes it's, 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 it's really, it's, it's, it's a mental struggle for them. But yeah, it's some it's it's questions that some soldiers ra raise and, and 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 it's not easy. And, yeah. And what and what about the debriefing? Uh, there is a question here from Hey Twiner about the debriefing with hostages. Um, how how extensive is that, Moisha? Do you know or Alon? Do you know how how that is going? Uh, I don't know. Maybe Moshe, Dr. Papi knows. Yeah, well, Moshe is enough. Yeah. Um, the, it depends what, what kind of debriefing we are talking about. Um, because there's the classical debriefing. It's, it's uh, like a psychological technique published on by Mitchell and Eberle in 2018, no, 1984, 1985. And we have like five meta analysis of this technique that shows that on the best case, these techniques, it's like a group discussion, uh, did not succeed, did not make, make things better. And the worst case, that those who experienced debriefing had more PTSD symptoms than those who did not have debriefing. And one of the reasons for that was that the, the classical perception of debriefing included mainly two, two rounds. The first round just tell us what happened? The second round was tell us what did you feel when it happened, and the third one was tell us how did you cope with the situation, with the situation, more or less. And uh, the um, problem was with the second round because when people start talking emotionally in a group, so it's like epidemic. Everyone is 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 responding to others' emotions, so we get like epidemia of emotions. And this goes out of control. So going to the third phase, how did you cope? The, the person who is handling this group finds it very hard to control the situation. So the, the group actually ends with being more miserable that 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 uh, should have been. So what we understood, again, we start learning from our mistakes that we're focusing about two things. We are focusing about the facts of the timeline and the facts of the doing, what the person did with the situation. This is the first thing that we need to do. And we understood, again, learning from our mistakes, we understood that one of the most important things that we need to have from the person to the group, to the community, to the state, is putting every fact in its chron chronological place emphasizing the ending stage. So the more we are less confused, the more we can cope and the more we can function. The more we are confused, so we start getting more and more intrusive thoughts because of the confusion. And that is why our priority is, first of all, to reduce the confusion and to put everything in mind. Gosh, talking about confusion, I cannot help but think about the division in Israel that we have read quite a lot about between the judiciary and and the government. Uh, this has been uh, quite an aggravating uh, split in the country. And, uh, and uh, Steve Holstein here um, has asked a question about how much that sort of division, and perhaps it relates to the, um, to the problem of confusion, um, how how this impacts on the trauma felt by civilians and soldiers alike. Hello. I think that once um, the unit is together, there is no confusion. Some you ask yourself, 
why can't we act like this is a society? I'm fighting alongside a religious uh, Ethiopian, someone from the periphery, from from the, the the city, someone who has completely different political approach than me, and we're all getting together perfectly. We're willing to sacrifice our lives together, and then once we're out of battle, we split. Everyone goes a different direction, and then again everything is confusing. Again everything is is. Uh, so problematic in our society so it's uh it's a big challenge it's a big challenge i want to say again i'm i've dealt mostly with soldiers in their mandatory duty most of them are 18 to 21 they're not they're they're not into those kind of things they're not really dwelling into those issues political issues they're really focusing on different things in their lives and how to be a better uh, commander or a better soldier or uh, how to get out of the base in the weekend and find a, a date or whatever. Um, but the, the reserve duty, those who are over 21, 22, 23, uh, 30, 35, I think that that issue is very, very relevant uh, once they get back from the re reserve duty, Miluim, how to get back to a normal society that could work together just like we did in Khan Yunis or any other place in Gaza. Adlon, you might have gone halfway to answering this question that David Schulberg has put forth, and that is, and, and Moshe, you may be able to comment on why this is the case. I don't know where he got his information, but last year Israel soared to the fourth place in the global happiness list highest since ranking started. Uh, so what does this suggest about Israelis and uh, the, um, the, the kind of trauma that obviously is also part of their existence, of the reality of keeping Israel alive and, and um, healthy, strong country? Did, did you have did did you ever did either of you ever suspect that Israel was you know up there in the top of the happiness stakes? Well, I'll, I'll answer. Um, first of all, uh, when you come to Israel, in general, you see a very nice country. You, you see really a country with which, which is so sophisticated with so many things and and so many great people and and uh, um, you can see an optimistic country you can see an optimistic country and the sense of October made our country not that optimistic and um, I just relate, want to relate to another elephant in the room talking about the, the confusion that you're talking alone sometimes there are people that their their interests are to keep this, this confusion, and and uh, because you know political views and and so on. So, and going back to your question, we want to go back to our optimistic situation, but we don't want to go back. I think as a nation to our naive situation. So we have to balance between these two. Yes, the golden mean. Well, I'd just like to thank you both so much, Elon and Moshe, uh, for answering my question so graciously and, and fully. But I also want to say that whatever happens in Israel, Jewish Australia is very much united in support of Israel and also many non-Jewish supporters of Israel have raised their voice in the last um, three months, or uh, is it uh, more than that, um, who have uh, made it very clear to the rest of Australia that they need to get behind Israel. And uh, we have been very grateful for their support as well. So I hope you feel some hope from us. Thank you. So, so very much, Alon, Moshe, and Rachel.
I was very, very privileged to be in Israel a few weeks ago as part of the ZFA Young Leaders Mission and the the spirit and the resilience of the Israeli people and how they just bounced back is honestly something that needs to be studied. And Dr. Falchi, that can be your next project. Um, I just want to say the three of you, your passion for the future of Israel and its youth who have, have been hit so hard in the past few months is, is truly inspiring. You have enlightened us on the importance of the transition back to normal life and have given us an insight into the lives of our brothers and sisters in Israel and in the IDF and the struggles that they are facing from both a psychological perspective, but also an academic perspective, which was a very beautiful combination. And I just want to say that you've also given us a lot of hope uh, about the way that we can move forward and, and create a stronger community and a stronger Israeli community and we can't thank you enough. Um, and we are also just very thankful, and I no, have no doubt that the Israelis too are very thankful that they have you by their side, guiding, strengthening, and empowering them. You are all the epitome of mutual responsibility, and we can't thank you enough. And thank you for sharing with us your stories and your experiences. Just know that, as Rachel said before, we are here, the Australian Jewish community. We, If you ever need anything, we are always there to support you. Um, just a reminder that the next ZFA conversations will be on April 14th, so stay in tune. Good night, and I'm Israel Chai. I'm Israel. Thank you.